Precious Jesus, we lift up your holy name this morning as we go into the world. We pray that you speak to us and cause us to understand your greatness and what you expect of us at this time. We are grateful for um, the understanding you will give. We are grateful for the prayers that we will pray. Let your angels that carry the incense be standing by so that they can mix the prayers with the sweet incense that will make them acceptable before you. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Multimedia, my first slide. I'm flowing from last week. Um, I'm talking about the gates, but I'm not going to talk about the gates. I'm going to talk about what the gates will love to achieve and why the devil doesn't want you to have sound gates. It's what in due season, Kairos is called, what in due season, that's flowing into the mind of God for what he wants to say at this season. And as we go on, you will understand what I'm trying to say. That where we find ourselves in prophecy requires the people showing a particular kind of emotion. And God expects them to do something positive with that emotion. The first question you will ask yourself, you read from Nehemiah chapter 1, the gates that were born. Who born the gates? Nebuchadnezzar born the gates. Have you ever seen a gate standing by itself? No. Gates are supported by walls. And walls, if you look at the Hebrew, has several meanings. One of them is the is Sheriel. That's the the entourage of the entourage of Queen of Sheba. That's how it was described. The entourage of Queen of Sheba. How glorious, how wonderful it was. So the wonderful nature that is you that God would love to have is going to be distorted when the gates are not defended. So the devil automatically would love to destroy the gates and the walls so that there is a distortion in personality. You get it? Look at the chart I have there. It's body, soul, and spirit. The eye, touch, ears, touch, blah, blah, blah. They are the gates. What is important is what is inside the gates. As information filters in, it shapes your personality. It shapes your faith. It shapes your mind. It shapes your emotions, your conscience, and allow or disapprove sin. That's why it's important to start like this, so that you will know what is at stake. The devil doesn't stop attacking the gates. If you think he did it to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar did it to Israel, and that was the end of it, joke. If you look at the gates he destroyed, starting from the fish gate onto the prison gate, they tell a story of redemption to heaven or hell. That's how important the gates were that Nebuchadnezzar had to destroy and Nehemiah had to rebuild. He tell a wonderful story that if you understand the intrigues there, you will see from the fish gate to the prison gate, it tells a good story of how to get to the end of the race, but I'm not going into, the, I'm not going into all that. How to get to the end of the race where you either go to the prison gate and judgment takes place, you are either rewarded or imprisoned. So that's how important the gates are. And that's why the devil doesn't stop attacking the gates. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse, no, chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, it says that we, we, we were all subject to the pools of the prince of the power of the air. And by nature, personality, we became children of wrath. Heading straight on a fast lane, what the Germans call autobahn, fast express lane to hell. We so said, going forward, thank God that we got born again, we announced it, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't stop trying to destroy the gates. He encountered Jesus on the mountain and he showed him a vision. See the whole world, see the beauty of everything, just bow down to me. He attacks, attacks. 
trying to distort personality. Changing the, change, change the man Jesus from being God in human flesh to ordinary man that will be attracted by this, by this, by this, the pride of life and the rest of the things that he presented to him. But blessed be the name of the Lord. He showed us the pattern. It is written. And as long as it is written, it's featuring in your brain, your personality, your mind will be tailored towards serving the Lord. Moving on, a review of what transpired. You saw the video and the video and the voters card picture telling you the state of Nigeria. And if you extend it to the world, you see the confusion and the hopelessness of life tomorrow. If it's life today, moving forward to tomorrow. The hopelessness of the situation, the, the lack of understanding of the Pentecostal leaders who says get a PVC. As if that can change anything. I saw the headline today, in, I think the punch. It said, it's now time for fire. By the helmsman over there. The big man at... Um, <laughs> the big man on the road that leads to Ibadan. Don't let us mention his name. This is where they have found themselves and his lack of understanding of the mindset of God. Here they are. Their personality has been distorted. A putting faith in perspective is started. The mind is filled with um, what you will call terrestrial things, things of this world, the seven mountains and the rest of them. Then the emotions, which I'm going to focus mainly on, is not charged correctly. Because when the emotions are charged correctly, you will get empathy. And that's why I call this message empathy. Most needed emotion today. Empathy. Most needed emotion today. We are in a state of irreversibility. Mark chapter 13, verse 8. In simple English, these are the beginning of sorrows. Abi, if you get it from NLT, another, you will break it down. NLT. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in many parts of the world as well as famines. But this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Birth pains doesn't end until the child is born. It's irreversibility. The, 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 all the prophecies in Matthew 24, nobody can stop them. What you can now do is with understanding you live above the times. I wrote a book, Rapture So Close, Judgment So Close, how to live above the times. Because the times won't change. Because you want it to change, no. You can only fit in and make the best of the situation that is at hand today. Britain, because of the problems in Ukraine, says, stop producing biofuel. Everybody that is doing biofuel, people have abandoned ordinary foodstuffs because Ukraine and Russia are giving them cheap food. They are now producing biofuel, plants that will turn to fuel. The greenhouse emissions, they want to do away with them. They want to do away with fuel. And they are producing biofuel, plants. Britain says, stop all these things, we are hungry. Is the person that is alive that will use fuel Please, remove everything and start planting food. <laughs> is that tough? Nigeria's inflation is 17% and above, thereabouts. I saw Ghana's inflation is 27%. That's high. You are complaining here. Fuel is over 600 naira per liter there. It's $1, around one point something. That's, fuel is around $700 per liter. And here, everybody is saying 165. A looter for anything. We will fight anybody. They must not add five cobble on top of the 165. They are paying over 700 naira for litre there. 
and everybody is out fighting, demonstrating that they want to change. They are hungry. And I see Nigerians saying, I will go, I will, I will relocate to Ghana. If you are so far. <laughs> light is so, 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 so amount. They are giving me crazy bills. If you know how much they are paying for light, you will go and renew your rent in Nigeria for two years so that the landlord does not eject you. I'm just trying to paint a scenario of where we are. Russia and Ukraine are among the top five global exporters of barley, sunflowers and maize, and account for about a third of the world's wheat exports. Listen to this. Nigeria is the world's fourth largest wheat importer in the whole world, number four. What's going to happen? I complain that they make noise in my clothes, those that come to buy bread. Now they don't come again. So I'm not able to sleep well. Before five o'clock, they are making noise, carrying bread. Now nobody shows up. My wife went to buy bread yesterday and brought it 400, 400 naira. I don't want to use lightweight, feather weight. Feather. That's where we have found ourselves. But is it not in the scriptures? Revelation chapter 6, 1 to 11. Quickly run through it. I'm trying to show you the state of the world, the state of Nigeria, so that when I begin to define empathy, you will understand where I'm getting at. Verse 1. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth, conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat, of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou art not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth mm. seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the four parts of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. That's up to where we are in prophecy. 12 to 17 speaks about the great tribulation. I'm not going to mention all these things in details. I'll just touch here and there. If you want to understand fully, go read Seven Seals by William Brayer. <clears throat> but more importantly, you saw death and hell filtering. You saw hunger. You saw killings here and there, here and there. Satan is just pushing people to hell because he's not stupid. He knows the time is short. It is Christians that want to live forever in this wretched world. The devil can see and understand the seasons as they are progressing. He's intensifying his efforts to get as many as possible to hell. And that's where you can't stop. I was planning a program with Victor 
in Kuali, and I said, let me ask my people over there. If I, you are my point man in that place, I'm coming to Kuali in August. The first thing he said was, ah, don't come. I said, wait till happen now. He said, they've kidnapped the king of Kuali, where we want to go. <laughs> they've picked the Presbyterian church pastor. They've picked another Pentecostal pastor. And all pastors are now hiding. Why do you want to come and open yourself? Oh, I have faith. Okay, then you're on your own. Me, I'm not joining you. <laughs> a long time ago, I was supposed to go to Niger State. I don't know whether that's pastor will remember. That was like 2001. 2000, yeah. And um, they came and said, please, don't come again. Oh. It was a university there, university. They said, don't come again. The Muslims, they said they are going to attack, blah, blah, blah. They will disturb you. They will do this. Some people said, go, God is with you. And I remember he said something. He said, Andy, it is the person that is alive that can do more. <laughs> if you want to finish it now, no wahala. Go now. I took notice and I thank you, sir. I quickly withdraw my. <laughs> it's just wisdom. And if you open the, the veils, you will see that the last, the last beast that came had the face of a man. All the other beasts, eagle, lion, ox, blah, blah, blah. The last beast that came for evangelism, because all the beasts came later on for the work of the Lord, had the face of a man. Brain, use your wisdom. At this time is important. But you find that in the brain there is a mind. And there is also the soul and the things, the components are showed. Most importantly, there is the emotion. And that's where we are going to be focusing on. As I ask, after you saw the, the, uh, the clips last week, what did you gain? I saw the reactions of some people, pity, sadness, and what have you. But those ones don't cut with the Lord. A sister called from outside here and said she, she followed the program that I should please send her the clips so that they can use to pray. That one caught the spirit of the message. She's not here. That so that we can use to pray. What's your reaction concerning the small scenario of Revelation chapter 6, 1 to 11? What's your reaction? I showed you, I saw horror. And I saw pity. I saw sympathy. Not even pity. I saw sympathy on Sunday as reactions to the video clips and what have you. This is not a scriptural reaction. Because sympathy ends there. And if I ask you, what did you do with what you saw on Sunday? Very few or nobody will be able to tell me anything positive. Horror will end there. Pity, sympathy will end there. A fine meal after service will remove the horror. My line. A fine meal after service will remove the horror. Those who watch African magic will laugh and forget what was shown in church. That's the end of it. Those who watch movies will do. Those who go for dinner, um, shop right, will go out, and that's the end of everything. If you have empathy, that won't be the end of everything. It won't. So I will define empathy for you. Compassion in the Old Testament revolves around pity, mercy, love, and stops there. Jesus exhibited compassion. He had compassion and he healed. Did you notice that there was no follow-up? Hmm? Did you notice there was no follow-up? He was moving on. Those who were wise joined him and followed with him. He had to tell some, go back. Go and testify elsewhere. 
But it will end there. Empathy will not end there. The New Testament definition, sympathy, pity, they revolve around the same thing. An emotional outburst that is temporary. But empathy is what we should be praying for. It's from the Greek word empathia, meaning physical affection or passion. That passion really click into what we are talking about today. It is the passion in the meaning that gives it an edge over compassion. Empathy encompasses a broad range of phenomena, including caring for people and having a desire to help them, which we also see in the meaning of compassion, but is not far-reaching. Compassion will do something, but it's not far-reaching. You will understand as I move on. It is experiencing emotions that match another person's emotion. I'm defining empathy for you. Experiencing emotions that match another person's emotion and removing yourself, your soul, your mind, your brain, your desires from interfering with the feeling to help those affected. In other words, you saw how they were slaughtering human beings. Said, what if it's me? What if it's somebody that I know? That's putting your emotions into the person's mind. You feel the same thing like somebody whose father was killed by them. I got a call from Astro FM in Abuja. They said we should stop mentioning Muslims that they will get angry and do something negative. <laughs> so let's say by those who killed them. Put yourself in the position of the person whose father was slaughtered. Not die normally, slaughtered. That's empathy. Putting yourself, putting yourself, experiencing emotions that match another person's emotion and removing yourself from interfering with the feeling to help those affected. After all, you saw it. Oh, what can we do? Stand big account. Ah, this is all I have. How am I going to help them? I beg, I beg God, take control. Empathy won't do that. Empathy will finish the account, whatever is there, to help those in such a situation. I'm bringing forth something. The emotion that God is asking for today. Because inside empathy, you find enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. The Greek word that starts enthusiasm is ethos. And that word means God in something. God in something. God in something. So if God is in charge of your emotions, it is empathy that you will feel. Not sympathy. Not sorrow. Not horror. Then enthusiasm will kick in to want to do something at all costs. But sorry, at all costs does not mean I have to go and do crusade there. Nah. Nah, nah, nah. I won't do that. I have a guy that works in the north. What they do now, they don't do open crusade anymore. They go to the place, a town, and mingle with the people. And take them as friends, one to one, to the point I showed Victor some pictures. One of them sitting down to do the hair of a daughter. Oh, your hair is too rough. Come, sit down. And began to do the hair. And as she was doing the hair, she was preaching to the child. They go in as commandos, attack, and quietly leave before anybody comes in. All they want is to secure somebody's salvation. 
And then later on, they send follow-up so that they can go back and minister to them again in the same manner. Not in the manner of, oh, it's time for crusade, oh, go, 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 go. We have to adapt to the situations that we have found ourselves today. So emotion is experiencing emotion. Sorry, empathy is experiencing emotions that match another person's emotion. Removing yourself from interfering with the feeling to help those affected. That's a nice way to describe passion. Passion is usually associated with I love my wife, romance. Um, February 14th, passion, passion, uncontrolled passion, blah, blah, blah. But you need to see the theme, passion of Christ, to understand what passion is. I'll define passion for you. Passion is defined as a violent emotion. Something one has a great enthusiasm for. Something preferred above all. Because from enthusiasm, I told you, it means enthos, and enthos means God is in it. So if God is in it, your reactions and the things that will come to pull you back from doing it will be minimal. You have something to fight yourself that says don't do it. You have something to fight it. Enthusiasm kicks in. The Greek word for passion is pasco. It means the opposite of free action. It means to doggedly continue in what one is doing, despite oppositions from outside influences. It is not an ordinary emotion. It is a violent emotion to prefer something above the others or above any other thing. You only need to go and watch football to understand what passion is. They are beating your club 5-0. You are still shouting, hey, 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 you will soon score, you will soon score. We score again. You better go home and go and cry at home. You are still hoping that he will score five and win and score six and win. That's passion. It's stupid. It doesn't make sense. But you doggedly follow it. After walloping you six nil, you still use your money to buy ticket for the next game. Instead of using your money to buy bread and eat and relax at home. You will still go there to shout, up Manchester, up Manchester. A lady was crying. Say, I don't even know why I support us now. They keep making me sad. <laughs> She's in London. No? They keep making, then why do you continue to support them? Passion. Passion. Stupid. I moved on. When I said, when girl was there, oh, up us now, up us now. When they started beating them. <laughs> I carry my bag. I don't want to get hypertension over something stupid. That's passion for you. It also means suffering for something because you accepted it. And that's what you see as you pray for the people in the north. You saw them in prophecy in that revelation that we read. The souls under the altar killed for the word of God and for what they believed in. Your prayers to strengthen them, your gifts to strengthen them and encourage them is most needful at this time. They are suffering because they have passion for something they have accepted. Many of us have this problem to continue to the end we cry, we cry, we cry. Evangelism today, tomorrow. Different, different kinds of things come up. From self to stop it. And then you go out. You hear bandits did this, armed robbers did this, and you come back and say, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah. And mommy says, I got food is ready. Uh -huh. Let's go. <laughs> You're supposed to go there. Do something in terms of witnessing and saving souls. You did not. But when you see the effect of you're not going, you just say, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah. And it ends there and the cycle continues. We are where we are today because of the inaction of the church. And I will get to that 
as we go on to what I call rent heaven prayer. Rent heaven prayer. Nehemiah's oh. body, you have jumped me. So let me just pick my scriptures here. I said so much definitions. Let's turn attention to practical examples. There is Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then I'm focusing on Nehemiah. Isaiah was the one that prayed the rent heaven prayer. That's why I'm going to be looking at it. Now, Isaiah 20, verse 2. Verse 2. Yep. At the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. Thank you. Look at his attitude. Permanent sorrow for a people who did not like him. He wore sackcloth. It's a symbol of humility. It's a symbol of pettiness. Symbol of sadness about the state <clears throat> of the people. They eventually killed him, put him inside a log of wood and cut it into two. And this was the same person that prayed the prayer rent heaven. Quickly, 2212. Verse 12. And in that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to guarding with sack clothes. Sack clothes. That is the state where the church should be today. With weeping, with sack clothes. That's where we should find ourselves. Let's jump the other scriptures. 32 11 says the same thing, 37 12 says the same thing. And I said, it's time, the time we are in, it's time to drop the psychedelic prayers and focus on deep, humble petition. Second Chronicles 7.14 is a scripture we like to read. People quote it often and often. Quickly. Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people who are called by my name. Verse 14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If my people <clears throat> who are called by my name, there is already a caveat in the prayers that people pray. There is a caveat already. If my people who... <clears throat> are called by my name to humble themselves. Who is wearing sackcloth among us? I saw a lady on Instagram. I shook my head. I shook my head like Shakespeare. I'm sure Shakespeare shook his head. That was why they called him Shakespeare. And the situation around. Victorian times was very bad as well. There must be a reason for calling him Shakespeare. I shook my head. This lady was dressed to kill dressed to kill she killed herself yes everything tight and she was preaching on the road about salvation on and on like that i said to myself why this is it to draw attention to yourself so they can hear the word of god i don't know but her dressing killed not me, people. The Bible says, situation gets to a level. It is the prayer of Isaiah you pray. Incidentally, the prayer is found in Isaiah 64. 64, 1 and 2. Verse 1. Oh, that thou wouldest rent the heavens, and that and that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence, as when the melting fire burneth, the fire causes the waters to boil, 
to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. It's a purpose for the prayer. Let the nations tremble at your presence. That's the bottom line. It is not that things will get better for us. You get to a point where you are no longer looking at everybody. You are looking at the glory of the living God for whatever the prayer you are praying for your nation. The glory of the living God. Maybe I told you this before. In Ukraine, that wonderful place, Ukraine, pastor sent me something yesterday and I laughed. Because the journalists, they always think that you forget. Internet does not forget. Even if I forget. Everything about Ukraine, what they said, abuse and abuse and abuse. All the bad, bad, bad things. Most corrupt nation in the world. Neo-Nazis. Neo-Nazis means new Nazis. Nazis of today. And then, the other side of it, good, 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 good things about Ukraine. The same set of people who said it will now change as if everything is just like that. Turn a switch. God looks at you. Hannah said, is a God by whom actions are weighed. And Hannah prayed the same prayer in 11, 1 Samuel 1, 11. Please read it before I define what Verse 11. rending means. Yeah. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and forget not thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a, male, a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Returning the glory to the Lord. Same thing. And he used, she used the same word. Look, rain heaven simply means from the Hebrew word ka, K -A -R, or kwar. That word means, oh Lord, heaven is very big. Oh. The earth is very big. Tear it open so that you can see me. Don't look at my neighbor. See me. That's the meaning of rain heavens. Tear the place. Enlarge your eyes. It means to enlarge your eyes like you use a magnifying glass to see something clearly. Our prayers, our lifestyle distorted. But sir, just look at me in this matter. For the glory of the living God, not even for me, for the glory that the nations may see you and say this is God having his way in this country. Our prayers are selfish. The prayers of the pastors are selfish. But it is scriptural. It is scriptural. <clears throat> very, very scriptural. Let's read. I'm not going to read everything. First Kings chapter 6. First Kings chapter 6 and 7. Just speak verses 32 and 33 of 6. You know the story. There was famine in the line. And then they killed their children and were eating their children. And the same thing is happening today. When you sell a child for 20,000 naira, have you not eaten the child? You think it's easy to kill a child? No. But circumstances beyond their control. Instead of aligning themselves with faith and doing the right things, they prefer to find an easy way out. Please read for me 32 and 33. First Kings 6, 32. The two doors also were of olive tree, and he carved upon them carvings of cherubims and palm trees and open flowers, and overlaid them with gold, and spread gold upon the cherubims. You are reading second, you are reading first Kings. I want second Kings. Second Kings. Verse 32. From 30. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes and he passed by upon the wall and the people looked and behold he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. Then he said God do so and more also to me if the head of Elisha the son of Shaphat shall stand on him this day. But Elisha sat in the house. Yeah. 
But Elisha sat in his house, and the elder sat with him. And the king sent a man from before him. But, but ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, See ye how this son of a murderer had sent to take away mine head? Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door, and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? 33. 33. And, while, and while he had talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him, and he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? Tough one. The situation in the country is of the Lord. Oh. <laughs> Some people have resigned. Say, what, can I, what can we now do now? Look. This is a people that were in dire situation. No hope. To the point that they started killing their children for food. Where was Eli Elisha? Enjoying himself. The king knew that the church is the representative of God on the earth. And they are the ones that should take charge. The church was raised to replace the Elohim Kansu. Because he said in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 that now to the intent that by the church shall the manifold wisdom of God be declared, made known to principalities and powers. By the church. Has the church done anything? Go and take PVC. Go and take PVC. If you don't take PVC, you won't come to church. Daddy showed us the clips, the videos and things. Is that the answer? A people that are living in mirth, that are living in illusions and delusions, want to pray, want to go and take PVC without settling their lifestyle, changing their lifestyle to the lifestyle of Isaiah, to the lifestyle of who, when my people who are humble shall pray. You see the Pentecostal leaders. They've even stopped it. Posing with Bentleys, with Rolls Royce. They say we should not mention names. Posing with arrays of fine, fine cars. And the church, people are hungry. IDPs are there. I mentioned it one time. I said I should mind my business. The people in the IDP camp said they have not seen any organization, any Christian organization to come and help them. When we went that we were the first, they will see. And my guy said, just do your own and remove your eyes. Leave everybody alone. And they are buying jets. One is planning to build a mega church on top of water. You, do not, you are saying, ah, you do not see it on YouTube. The design is out. Third mainland bridges, we are going like that. Where all those gedus are, in Okobaba, on the water. That's where one is planning a mega church. Costing billions of dollars. And people are hungry. Christians are in IDP camps being killed every day. Nothing is being done for them. Don't you think we should go beyond sympathy? So wearing sackcloth. Saying, Lord, open the heavens and look down on us. Isaiah said, shine your eyes, O Lord. Enlarge your eyes to the situation we have found ourselves. He saw the holy city desolate, the land destroyed, the people of God being carried away into distant lands and shouted, where are you, Lord? If only I can persuade God to see us something good will happen. That was his reaction. What is your own reaction to the things you saw last week? Because if I ask now, I don't think anybody will give me a positive reaction. It ended on Sunday with one big bowl of Amala. That ended it. We should do things right. Nehemiah's body when Elisha said, this is of the Lord, 
the man recognized that Elisha was the problem of the land, not the Syrians. He said, I will cut off Elisha's head. The army that besieged them was out there. He did not even think about them, raising up people to go and fight. He said, where is the prophet? God will be asking the same question, where is the prophet? In Isaiah 59, he said, the hand of the Lord is not sure that he cannot help you. It is the people's sin that has separated God from the answers. He listed different kinds of sins. In verse 16, he said, I looked for an intercessor. When you see look in Bible, it's not look like this. It is searching, 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 searching. God said, I was looking, searching, searching everywhere for intercessors. I didn't see any. Where are you today? Come to church, sing, dance, go home, repeat it the next day. Information from the pulpit is supposed to be fuel for action. It's not information to be stored. It's supposed to be information for action. Nehemiah's body. Let's assume Rao, those who know him, an old general. He wrote a book, God's Champion. He said in that book, he said, I'm a pastor for the work of God to progress. I don't want 20 pastors, 40 church workers, 200 apostles. Just give me one Nehemiah. One. I don't even want to. Just give me one Nehemiah and I know that I will have a successful ministry. As you read the story, verse 1 and verse 2, Nehemiah 1, verse 2. Verse 2. That Anani, one of my brethren, came. That Anani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. This man was an embodiment of empathy, a caring person. He was the one that asked, How are these people? How are they doing? Who is asking? What's going on up there? What's going on in the north? How are they faring? Who is asking? This man demonstrated empathy. A caring person. He asked, how are the people there? How are they doing? He wanted to know, to be satisfied that all was well with them. Who is caring? Even for one another in church, for one another in the body of Christ, who is caring? You see their shortcomings and you laugh at them. Oh, Babylon, oh, Babylon. What do you do about it? Do you get on your knees to pray? If somebody is not seeing it today, does that mean that I can't see tomorrow? With Abraham, in the sermon, uh, the statue of the matured man, the statue of the matured man, he listed the pyramid. And on top of it, he said, this is where we are. We are looking down on the shortcomings of the church ages. We are seeing everything. We may be small, but we are seeing what they don't see. What do you do about it? The best you can do is to pray. And as God gives opportunity to speak. But who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Enough to want to do either of this. Is the question we are trying to ask ourselves. Verse 4. And Verse it came to, three, pass came to pass when I heard those words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. The answer to his question about what happened here, he was told this and this and this and this and this happened. He said, when I heard, I wept, not for 10 minutes, many days. He was so caught up with what transpired for a people that he did not know. He was a third generation thereabouts. He didn't come from, he was born in Babylon. So I said, empathy removes your own feelings from you so that you can feel the emotions of those afflicted. 
He could say, I'm the governor. I'm, I'm a minister in the, in the palace. I'm settled. I'm okay. He did not say that. I called him in a message, Mr. Romantic. Somebody who was willing to die for the love of a God and a Jerusalem he had never seen. But he was in tune with the God. Because if you look at the meaning of the world, I told you, if there's no wall, nothing can happen. Nothing. The beauty of anywhere is the gates and the wall. No gates, no wall, the place is just there. Any idiot can just come in. And that was why he wept from in verse 2, chapter 2, verse 1. Quickly read it. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now, I had not been before time sad in his presence. This man from Kislev, the time when he had the story was Kislev, the month called Kislev. That's around December. On to Nisan. Nisan is around late March stroke, early April. The moon determines the beginning of the month. So for four months, somebody was crying. Four months, not days now. He wept many days and it extended for four months till the king saw his countenance and said, my friend, what's wrong with you? I've never seen you like this before. And he had to tell the king what was ailing him so that action could take place. Because the next thing he said, if the king will do this, if the king will allow me this, the king will allow me this, let me do something. Let me not just be quiet in my El Dorado. Let me go and do something. Let me leave my comfort zone. Travel through the desert. He could die in the desert. Three months journey to go and build a place where he did not know. But for the glory of the living God, he was willing to do it. What do you think ran through his mind? What do you think? Number one, the guy was a caring man, a display of empathy. Compare him to Elisha, the one God gave the mandate to. He was seated with elders. You don't entertain elders with water. No. You entertain elders with things. God will take care of you. God take care of you. You, are, you have enough to even entertain people. People are killing themselves in the streets, killing their children in the streets. And the man of God was enjoying himself. And that's the picture that you see today all over the place, across the board. Somebody boasted that God is wonderful. In the time of COVID, when there were no offering, I bought a jet. And it was a testimony. Now, I'm buying a third one. I was in a plane with him one time. Now, he has his own. He went to Liberia. He was in the plane too. Today, he has his own jet. And I keep telling Pastor Noel, come, come, let's do something. Let's get our own jet. <laughs> and the guy is doing like this. <laughs> wow. But that is the church for you. Don't let's hide it. That is the church for you. The Elisha syndrome has overtaken everybody. And the church, the world is suffering because of where they are. Get PVC in Ukraine. Adelaja had the biggest church in the whole of Europe. He said, it's time to move. We must put Christians here. We can't be continuing to suffer. We can't continue suffering under these politicians. Let's mobilize ourselves. They mobilized themselves. They defeated the politicians. Less than six months, they were taking them to court for corruption. Not even after their time. Within a period of six months to one year, 
they have started taking them to court. The people who were speaking against corruption, when they got in, they did the same thing, if not worse. Politicians will even do three years, four years before you notice anything. This one's now immediate, immediate. See money, ah. All I need to do is just sign. He himself, it was only God that saved him. They roped him in, in corruption cases. Today, where is the church? The person that had the biggest church in Ukraine is now a refugee. He said he lost over $20 billion when he left Ukraine. He said it himself. And that's what we kill ourselves for. I must get, I must get, I must get, I must get. As if you own time. Elisha said, God has ordered this man to come and kill me. He said, this mother is of the Lord. Why would God kill his servant, his prophet? Because he wasn't doing what was expected of him. You are of no use. Who could die? Let the king kill you. So we know we don't have a prophet in the land. And that's why you see them today. It was, it was sad when Evangelist Ephraim told me that all they are targeting now in the north are pastors. They are not even picking anybody again. Pastors. And you are seeing scriptures coming alive in the Elisha syndrome. It's time to cut off the head of Elisha. They killed one in the, in the east recently. They killed one in, in the north because money wasn't forthcoming on time. And he said, all of us, we are now hiding our heads. Anywhere you are stepping out, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall know one. He make me to lie down. Then quickly jump to Psalm 91. Those under the wings of the shadows of the Lord shall abide. Till you get to where you are going, you have to be interchanging Psalm 23 and 91. Because when it was time for action, nobody did anything. Let me, let me end it here. With that in mind, I want us to pray for the next 30 minutes. I try to point attention to the reaction that God expects of us at this time. As you get your PVC, change. Become the servant of God that is standing in the place where God has put you. You can't be having dinner with the elders, attending state meetings, state dinners. What are you going to tell them? What are you going to tell them? This is the time to stand for the Lord and for the glory of the Lord. Isaiah said, Oh, that you will tear open heaven to look down on our situation so that the nations around us will feel your presence. It was after the glory of God, not clearing a set of politicians away so that they can come in. If only they understand the evil that plagues politicians, you will even be sorry for them. Ruben Abati left Jonathan's government and he wrote an article explaining that in Aso Rock, you are walking like this, you'll be hearing footsteps behind you. You will look, you will not see anybody. <laughs> you will pass a room, somebody will be crying inside the room. You will open the door, you will not see anybody. He said the place is full of demons. Just waiting for the next. Put Gio there. It's going to be a battle to get the presence on the right path. But it is righteousness that exalts a nation. It is righteousness that exalts a nation. It is not how many people have voters' card to vote somebody in. You vote somebody in, righteousness is not in the nation. The same thing will happen. You're going to give the demons a leeway, a door. And once they see that righteousness is not in the country, the Christians are not standing their ground to pray for the ones they put in there. At the end of the day, the cycle continues. 
And people will blame God. Where were you? You didn't listen to us. You didn't listen to us. Where were you? Where were you? God is a God of knowledge by whom actions are weighed. Let's get up and pray.